Sure. Uh, before we get started in today's message, I want to pray for us that God would meet us here today. So, Heavenly Father, uh, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity, for this beautiful day, for your beautiful people who stand and sit with us in this moment. Lord, I pray that we would encounter you for real in this, in this moment. Lord, use me in all of my inabilities, despite all of my lack, Father, to, to talk to me and to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, admittedly, one of the things I love about this Real Love series is that we get to be real about things like love. Now, one of the things I hope that you've realized so far in the last number of weeks is that everything when we talk about love is not all uh, rainbows and butterflies. It's not all feel good. As a matter of fact, once you kind of get down beneath the surface, there's actually some pretty difficult things that I hope we are handling well. Now, today I want to talk about something that is a real feeling and a very powerful thing in all of our relationships, in all of our lives, as a matter of fact. And it's something that is paramount that we talk about so that we can learn how to navigate it and have real healthy relationships with God and with other people. Uh, today we're talking about two wonderful things of loneliness and rejection. Now, if you are alive and you have a pulse and you are dealing with other people, you are going to encounter loneliness and rejection. I think the primary reason is that uh, something we see in Genesis 2 and 18, early in the, in the scripture, as soon as we get an account of humanity entering into this world, uh, the Bible says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man or for man to be alone. So he made a, a helper corresponding or suitable for him. What we see here in this text here in Genesis is that we were physically, spiritually, and emotionally created for relationships. If you were to go to any seminary and study the nature of God, you would hear that God is himself a trinity, that God himself is in relationship, and we were made for relationships. And much of the pain and the sadness and the difficulty is because we lack the fullness of relationships that we desire and were created for. Now, one of the challenges is that sin, when sin entered the world in, in Genesis, it did not just disrupt our relationship vertically with God, but it also disrupted our relationship with other people. So that the, the sin that we experience and that we commit, the weaknesses that we have as people, the wounds that we have suffered from our parents and others and loved ones, and the damages also as well prevent us from loving people fully. And we ourselves not just experience loneliness and rejection, but if we were to keep it all the way live, we are the ones who cause other people to feel loneliness and rejection. Loneliness is a separation anxiety brought on by the feeling of being disconnected or out of touch. It's the loss of intimacy of feeling or, or, or belonging. Now, 2020, in the height of the pandemic, particularly for those of you who are single and were living alone, um, felt more than others uh, a great deal of what it felt to be lonely, to have a loss of intimacy, to be separated from those you love, to not be in someone's pod. But what I've realized over the years is that whether you are single, divorced, widowed, or even if you're married, there's a great deal of loneliness that can happen where you feel alone. One of the things that's about New York City, which is fascinating, is that you can be surrounded by people and still feel alone. Some of you have, know what it feels like to be in a marriage where you are with someone 24-7 and you still feel alone. Uh, rejection is equally painful. Rejection is to refuse to grant someone recognition or acceptance to discard that individual as being, as being worthless. Now, most of us in our day-to-day -day interaction would never uh, say that we do to someone, but so many of us have felt discarded or worthless in moments, and man, that is incredibly painful. W one of the most painful memories I can think about in high school uh, happened in 11th grade uh, um, history, and I was talking in class, and the teacher went around and was asking a question. I raised my hand, I was the only black kid in class, and I answered it, and I'll never forget her response. Instead of saying, instead of affirming me for giving the right answer, she looked at me and she said, how did you know that? With an accusatory tone. And in that moment, I felt worthless. I felt discarded. To be perfectly honest, 
I didn't pay attention for, rest, for the rest of the year in that class because I didn't feel any connection. I didn't feel invited or accepted because she was surprised that a young black boy knew the answer in this class. Now, whether it is a teacher, a parent, a loved one, a spouse, all of us will feel rejection in different ways. And loneliness and rejection are incredibly painful no matter what we tell ourselves or no matter what other people tell us. Uh, there's an experiment that was done, a game called Cyberball. Now, there was a professor who de de um, designed this game. And basically, what, what he was after was trying to elicit the physical response we experience when we experience rejection. Here's what he found. So basically, he created a game called Cyberball, and he had three participants. One person was the subject in the experiment. The other two people were in on it. And it was a video game where three people were, were playing Frisbee. Now, nobody in here, unless you're like an ultimate Frisbee fan, uh, ultimate Frisbee player, most of you don't even know what that is. Um, most people are not that <laughs> Jamie's into. Most people are not that into frisbee, so you know it's not something that you are emotionally connected to. But in Cyberball, three people are passing around uh, a frisbee, and then two people just start passing it back and forth between each other, excluding the other person. So you start out, everybody's kind of going around in a circle. It's fun, it's fun, and then all of a sudden, you, the participant, are sitting there, and they're just passing it back and forth to each other. Now, what they found was fascinating. Even in something as meaningless as a video frisbee game, what they found is the same area of your brain that lights up for physical pain, like being punched in the stomach, lights up for rejection. Even when you don't know the people, even when it's insignificant, here's what they, the author says, as far as your brain is concerned, a broken heart is not so different from a broken arm. Now imagine that it's not a meaningless frisbee game, Imagine that it's someone you really liked, someone you love, a parent, someone who was in charge of your caretaking, to experience rejection from them. Imagine how much more intensified it would be. Now, all of us experience rejection in a number of ways. Uh, rejection can be uh, material, uh, something that we want that is withheld. Maybe it's a, um, uh, you know, Halloween candy that you want. Um, one of the things that's interesting about kids, uh, my kids, especially small children, they are windows into our souls. And one of the things that hurts my six-year-old more than anything in this world is to withhold a treat from him. Even though it's a small piece of material, to withhold a Reese's Pieces after he's had six on Halloween, <laughs> to him is, is much bigger than just to withhold this piece of candy. In this moment, to receive a treat is not just to receive a Reese's, it's to receive affirmation and love from his parents. And to not have it leads and has led to a certain meltdown. <laughs> All of us want things, and to have those things withheld from us, it's, it's painful. Going up the ladder a little bit in intensity, we can also experience rejection verbally. When someone attempts to talk and someone doesn't respond uh, in the way that you want them to, or even worse, they weren't listening. Uh, man, I read a tweet this past week. Yo, this joint was brutal. It says this, did it hurt when you had to fade your voice out while you were telling a story to a group of people once you realized nobody was really paying attention? <laughs> Woof. You're like, yeah, so, look, so I went down, to, I was on 25th, I went to Popeye's, and the whole crowd is just like, they just, you're like, and then um, I had a two-piece spicy and... And like 30 minutes later, somebody was like, wait, weren't you saying something about Popeyes? You're like, no, it's, it's too late. It's too late. Don't talk to me now. Uh, but verbal rejection, uh, to receive that, particularly from someone you like, if you're single and you're dating and you don't, instead of getting accepted and sought after and responded to in the way that you want, to receive rejection from that, that, man, that, that, that hurts. Uh, physical rejection, and certainly in marriages, um, a lot of people have experienced this, and uh, I know this is a sensitive topic. Hopefully, we don't have too many children in here right now. Uh, I'll say it as PG as I, as I know how to say it right now. Um, one of the things that is challenging in marriages, for those of you who are married and experiencing rejection there, is I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. But there is a great deal of physical rejection, and there's also emotional 
rejection that happens um, in marriages. Now, I don't know what comes first, the physical rejection or the emotional rejection, but what ends up happening, which I have seen, quite honestly, destroy relationships, is that when one partner is physically rejected, they shut down and withdraw emotionally. And when another partner is emotionally rejected, they shut down and withdraw physically. And what you have is this deepening cycle of resent, of anger, of frustration, and of compounding rejection. Now, three truths about emotion that I know to be true, we mentioned this last week, is this. Unprocessed emotions don't die. That rejection that you've experienced from someone you're dating, that rejection that you've experienced from your significant other, they don't die. They get buried alive. You can try to pretend like it doesn't hurt. You can sprinkle all the affirmation on top of it that you want to, but they do not die. They get buried alive. Number two, if you do not heal from what has hurt you, genuinely, seriously hurt you, you will bleed on people who did not cut you. And number three, healthy relationships require that we know ourselves. We know what is going on on the inside of us. So whether the rejection that, that was the first thing that comes to your mind right now was material, if it were verbal, if it's physical, or if it's emotional, and certainly there's so much emotional rejection that lives well outside of marriages and friendships and dating relationships, to not receive with reciprocity the affection that you have for someone else, man, that is devastating. So how do we feel and how do we respond to, as a matter of fact, how do we navigate this certain landscape in front of us, which is that because we live in a world that has been broken by sin, because we deal with people who are sinners, people with weaknesses, people with wounds, and people with damages, how will you respond to, re to loneliness and rejection? Now, there's a lot of different options for you to do. We can pretend like it doesn't hurt. Uh, we can brush it aside. We can slap some scripture on top of it. Uh, but I think the scripture offers us a much better path forward in how we navigate real loneliness and real rejection in our lives so that we can heal from it, so that we can be healthy and thriving in our relationship, so that we don't carry unnecessary baggage, so that we can understand God better and the gospel better in this whole process. So here's what I want you to do. Um, on Mondays, what we're aiming to do is having all of our sermon notes on our app and on our website. Uh, if you go to our sermon, which gets posted on Monday at some point, uh, there should be a tab under there on notes. So definitely want to make sure you download the app for that reason. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot of stuff right now. You can take notes now or check it out in the sermon notes later. But number one, how to respond to rejection is, yo, you have to feel it. You have to feel it. Last Sunday, I don't know if you watched the sermon, we're, on, we're here in the building. I challenge everybody to go through an exercise of, uh, called emptying the emotional jug, and we'll get to that a little bit later today. And I was on my DNA group call this past Tuesday morning, and I'm not going to uh, call anybody, anybody out by name. And I was asking the people in my group, they were like, yo, Jay, sermon Sunday was fire, bro. Appreciate that, man. I was like, yo, but did you do the exercise? And they were like, no. I'm like, you're in the group of me. You knew I was going to ask you if you did it, and you still didn't, <laughs> you still didn't do it. Uh, we don't like to feel things. As a culture, we do not like to feel things. Now, our culture and the church at large is terrible with, the, with number one. Now, Scripture tells us that we are to trust in him at all times, you people in Psalm 62 and 8. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. We are encouraged to deeply unearth and excavate everything that is within us and to pour it out on God, yet we don't want to do it. Now, here's how we avoid this in a number of different ways. Our culture, instead of feeling negative emotions like sadness from rejection, we slap on crazy and excessive affirmation on top of it. So if you go to your friends and tell them that you're feeling bad, they say, yo, that dude was a loser anyway. You don't need to be with him. You got, man, like, wait till, wait till you get what you, what's coming your way. You're going to be so happy that, you know, he didn't hit you back or she didn't hit you back. And what we do is we take something that is good, which is affirmation, and affirmation is a good thing. And instead of allowing someone to feel those emotions, we just pour out affirmation on top of a wounded heart instead of letting someone feel it. The church goes the other extreme 
And what the church does is we slap scripture on top of everything. We make people feel that if you are really holy, if you really love Jesus, if you are satisfied by the Holy Ghost, then you will not experience negative emotions or difficult emotions like sadness. Like, you'll, like the holiness of Jesus is somehow going to make you not feel sad at any given point. Both extremes are incredibly unhelpful because those negative emotions that you're feeling, they do not go away. They just get buried alive. So number one, we have to feel it. And um, last week we talked about this exercise called emptying the emotional jug. And if, I, if you call me your pastor, if you say you are a part of Renaissance Church, you have to do this. The notes will be in the app again on how to do it. It is an exercise that will take you 15 minutes. Do not tell me um, that uh, you're afraid of doing it because uh, here's what I, what I realized. This past week I was talking to some people and most people I knew didn't want to do this exercise because they were afraid that their sadness was a bottomless pit. And that once they got into it, that they would never be able to come out from it. Now, thankfully, that's not true. What you will discover is that by engaging with all of your emotions, the healthiest thing you can do is to bring them to the surface so that they can stop bleeding you out from the inside. So this exercise, it asks four questions of you three times in a row. So it says, what am I angry about? And you ask yourself, what am I angry about? And is there anything else I might be angry about? And to write that. Now, don't let the logical you into the room. For 15 minutes, I want you to set a timer and I want you to feel. I don't want you to think. Most of us are so terrible with feelings that we don't even know what a feeling is. So here's a quick thing. A lot of us will say, well, I feel that. No, you don't feel that. You feel disappointed. You feel sad. If you have to add that at the end of the statement, that's a thought, not a feeling. So I am angry about this. It doesn't have to make sense. Logical you doesn't get a chance to tell emotional you what's going on. At the end of the 15 minutes, let logical you back into the room, and he or she can explain away whatever you want them, can rationalize, can have that conversation. So number one, what am I angry about? Number two, what am I sad about? Please allow ourselves to answer these questions honestly, vulnerably. Once you get to the bottom of this, I guarantee, shoot me an email, you will feel so much better after you do this. By not engaging it, it's not going to go away. The only way to really deal with it is by dealing with it honestly. What am I sad about? What am I anxious about? What am I anxious about? What are you anxious about if you are experiencing rejection in dating? Are you anxious that you're never going to find a partner in life? What are you anxious about if you're married to someone that you're experiencing rejection from? Are you anxious that your life is going to be, you, you and your spouse are going to continually grow separately and you'll eventually just be roommates one day? Now, what happens if you never process that? Are, is that going to make you a healthier person, more enabled to engage with relationships? Man, I, I seriously doubt that. And the last question is, what are we glad about? Inviting the gladness of what, to remember what God is doing in our life into that situation. Um, I went through that pretty quickly just now, but I would love for you to check out the notes uh, in the app that will be out tomorrow or watch last week's message on that. So number one, I want you to feel it, and I want to challenge you to feel all the negative, negative and difficult emotions associated with rejection and loneliness. Number two, I want you to speak it to trusted people. Speak it to trusted people. Now, if you're single and you got ghosted online, I'm not saying hunt the person down. <laughs> DM them from another account that, from, a, from a Finsta and then like, yo, you really hurt me when you did that. Don't do that. That's like stalkerish if you do that. Uh, but we need trusted people with whom we can uh, speak out the truth of our feelings and how we are processing the world. Romans 12 and 15 says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Scripture assumes that we have people to, who can walk with us in all of our, the complexity of our emotions. Now, if you are going to speak this to a person who is the person who rejected you, so if this is to a friend who you were really counting on to do something and they didn't do it and you felt lonely and rejected, if you're speaking this to your spouse who rejected you emotionally or physically, I don't want you to handle this conversation poorly. So here's what I want you to be thinking about. How do you have that conversation? Uh, you have to have it vulnerably. First, you have to get in contact with what you're actually feeling. But number two, you need to lead with vulnerability in the conversation. So if you are expressing to someone else the rejection 
that they are the person who rejected you, I want you to lead with vulnerability. Not lead with accusation, not lead with what they did, to lead with vulnerability, to lead with the emotion. Ephesians 4 and 29 says, no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. So in this conversation, I want you to be thinking not just is this truthful, but there's a word in Ephesians that is included. Is this helpful? And you should weigh your words not just with what is truthful, but what is, what is helpful. You don't need to include every single thing in this conversation. Now, we've all been the target and the recipient of words that have been spoken to us that are truthful, but not helpful. There is no more truthful person on this planet than an older Jamaican woman. <laughs> I got married a couple of years, a number of years ago, and went to my grandmother's house in Queens, and uh, one of our family members and relatives was there. You know, when you first fall in love, you know what I'm saying, you, you don't follow in a, a diet the way you might follow it later in life. You're happy, you're getting dessert every meal. And yes, it was true at that time, I started to pack on some pounds. And I get back from my honeymoon, with, this is probably worse, I had a bag of McDonald's in my hand. <laughs> and I saw my, my relative, I walked to the door, I'm all hyped to see everybody. She said, Jordan, why you fat? I was like, <laughs> I'm sucking my stomach in for the rest of the time we were. Uh, it was true, I definitely was putting on some weight, but not helpful, not necessary to include this. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of stuff that we put in our conversation that's not necessarily helpful for the hearer. To lead with vulnerability means that you start off with how you are feeling. I felt saddened by this. I felt rejected. I felt bad. And to really, truly say that and not add unnecessarily wor unnecessary words behind that. So here's a, the thing about this. If someone shares with you their vulnerability, if it's a friend who accepts uh, uh, a conversation about how you're dealing with rejection, Jesus gives us a, a big warning. He says, don't cast your pearls to swine. In other words, what Jesus tells us to do in conversations and in relationships, Jesus says, there are some things that are precious. There are some things that are valuable, and we should never give what is valuable to people who will just trample all over it. If you are the recipient of someone's vulnerable, real, raw emotions, do not be the swine. Do not be someone who tramples over their vulnerability with defensiveness or with logic. They don't need to hear your logic. They don't need to hear your side of things. If they come to you with vulnerability, be the person who can receive their words and listen to them. So number one, I want us to feel it. Number two, I want us to speak it. Number three, I want us to refuse to retaliate. I don't know who the author of this is. Eventually, probably at the 11.30 service, I'll say that I made this up. But pain that is not transformed will be transmitted. In your life, pain that is not transformed will be transmitted. You will pass it on to other people. Romans 12 and 17 says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Uh, one of the things that's interesting this week on Twitter, I was asking questions from all my single folks who are doing online dating, and um, I was asking them, like, yo, what does it feel like to be ghosted? And so many people responded to me in my DMs saying, honestly, now I don't even think about it anymore. I just kind of like, it is what it is, and now I start ghosting everybody else. And I'm like, okay, that's one way of handling it. Uh, if you are a Christian, if you follow Jesus, I think we need to be real and honest uh, with ourselves to realize that the pain that we have expe ourselves experienced, the rejection, man, we're just passing that on to other people. Uh, one thing that they noticed in the study about the cyber ball, the Frisbee game, is that they took some of the participants who had just been rejected, and then they put them in another study, that they were the administer of giving spice to different participants. So they were the person who determined how much spice a person got, and they told them, this group of five people doesn't like spice. And we're trying to determine, you know, the human taste buds and all these different things. The person who just got rejected, like, started out with, like, tablespoons and tablespoons of the spiciest food. Because they themselves had experienced pain, they wanted other people to feel pain. I think there's so much of our life that we are transmitting pain to other people because we haven't processed it 
ourselves, and we need to prayerfully refuse to retaliate to the person who has rejected us or uh, to other people down the line that we might encounter. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned uh, one of the spiritual practices I have are doing the dishes. And in my own relationship, when I feel rejected, I say, Jordan, left to myself, I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to retaliate with emotional and physical rejection. So I need to go do the dishes. And I go in the kitchen, and it might just be one dish in there, and I'll scrub that joint for like 30 minutes. Because <laughs> uh, I need to do something to refuse to, to retaliate because I easily can be petty, and so can you. So uh, number four, so number one, we need to feel it. We need to speak it. We need to refuse to retaliate. Number four, we need to interrogate it. Now, here's where we're going to start to invite in the logical person in some ways. Um, I, I think we need to weigh the rejection that we are experiencing in the grand scheme of things. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, we are too prone, we are too prone to, engage, to engrave our trials in marble and write our blessings in sand. We are too prone to engrave our trials, our difficulties in marble, etched in, but to write our blessings in sand. I think if we were to zoom out in certain moments and to look at the grand scheme of things of what the Lord has blessed us with presently, it would shine some light and some context on the rejection we might experience uh, in any moment. Another challenge that we can interrogate is, uh, there is always in our lives, in our hearts, a misplacing of what is truly valuable and needed and necessary in any given moment. So much so that I think it's really easy to put on one person all of our hopes and all of our dreams and to believe that if this one person accepts me, loves me, and uh, welcomes me, then all of my loneliness and rejection will go, will go away. Now, the Bible would call that, in so many different ways, idolatry, that we've made a good thing an ultimate thing. Now, not saying it's not good to receive love and affirmation from people, not saying it's not a good thing to be married, it's certainly good things, but if we are banking on one person to fix us, one person to heal us, and that one person ain't Jesus, we are setting ourselves up to be disappointed. I think we owe it to ourselves in these moments that we're feeling rejection after we have felt it, spoken it, refused to retaliate, is to ask ourselves to interrogate it, Lord, what was I hoping that this situation would bring me? Was I hoping to finally feel validated? Was I hoping to finally feel secure? If the answer to that is yes, then we may have put too much weight on it, uh, unnecessary weight on it. Now, I think the challenge also in uh, dealing with rejection is that it unearths a lot of insecurities that we already had. Lisa Tukers in her book, Uninvited, talks about rejection, and she talks about how self-rejection paves the way. It's the landing strip for the rejection of others to arrive and pull up on the gates of our hearts. Think about when other people say or do things that make you feel rejected. Isn't it in part due to the fact that they just voice some vulnerability that you have already berated yourself for? It hurts exponentially more when, you've kicked, when you're kicked in an already bruised shin. Now, so I want us to feel it, I want us to speak it, I want us to refuse to retaliate, I want us to interrogate it. What are the pieces of this scenario that, I've actually, that have been idolatrous, that I've been wanting this person to be Jesus? What are the parts of this that I have been, that are just unearthing secure insecurities inside of me that have been there for a long time? And last thing is I wanna invite Jesus in to our rejection. Now, one of the things that is profound about Christianity is that Christianity does not respond to your real needs and real feelings with an argument. It responds to your real needs and your real feelings and your real longings with a person. Christianity is not about a better argument. It is not something to be debated in philosophy class. It is about a person, namely Jesus. And if we are to really truly navigate what it means to be lonely or rejected, we need to invite Jesus into this. Now, one of the things that makes Jesus great and a great savior is that he feels exactly what you feel. He's felt it all. One of the most powerful phrases in the English language are, me too. Because there's something uh, profound and powerful about going through a struggle, a worry, or a concern, which we all do from time to time, and instead of hiding from it or concealing it, that someone else we can go to that has felt that and has gotten to the other side. Now, one of the most fascinating implications about 
um, the fact that Jesus, God came from heaven and put on flesh is that God understands you because he has been where you have been. Isaiah 53 and 3 says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. We didn't value him. Jesus knows everything about you. One of the things that we'll get to in a couple of weeks when we get to our Christmas season, besides just Mariah Carey on repeat, is we'll read a scripture where we say that Jesus is a wonderful counselor. Think about that. What makes Jesus a wonderful counselor? Not a good counselor. What makes Jesus a wonderful counselor? The best counselors are people who have been through a problem and they've come out on the other side. They're okay now but they've gone through the thing and they have emerged on the other side. Jesus is our wonderful counselor because the word became flesh and he dwelled and he lived among us. I heard a story about a young x-ray technician and um, he said he had a real revolution in the way that he handled his profession. Now, he wasn't sure just how everything worked back then when he was new in his work, but he would always get a, a lot of complaints in the way that he would handle people that, you know, to get an x-ray for something that is painful, the lower part of your body, they pump you full of fluids, and they make you get into a lot of uncomfortable positions. And over and over again, he would just almost be, you know, insensitive to how people were feeling in the moment, and he would just kind of be plopping people down on the table, making sure he got his images so that he wouldn't get written up for not having clean images. But that was until one day, he himself needed to be on that table that he had pain, and he had to experience what it felt like to rotate on the x-ray table, that he had to feel and experience all the things, all the pain of that moment. To come out on the other side meant that he handled people much more differently. Now, the the craziest thing about Christianity is, is that it says that God left heaven and came down and got on the table. He knows what it feels like to be rejected, to be turned, to be twisted, much more than we'll ever know. That's what the incarnation of Jesus is saying. No other religion would dare to say that the God who created the universe has been on the table. So whether it's hunger, loneliness, homelessness, grief, rejection, betrayal, torture, injustice, Jesus has experienced it all. So what does that mean for us in our prayer lives? It is a revolutionary thing. It means that if you are experiencing real pain of rejection, Jesus knows what it feels like. Not just from not just from other people, but also from God. Jesus got on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced rejection so that we can receive being welcomed. Not too many of us in our, in our day-to-day life, we live as functional atheists, that when the pain of life hits us, we turn away from the very God who has come to save us. God invites us in to come to him, all of you who are heavy laden and burdened, And he will give us rest. How will he give you rest? Because he understands exactly what it feels like to be on this table. So I want to pray for us right now that we would experience from God a real renewal in our life. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray for boldness and courage this week. I pray for the courage to confront and to name and to speak and to deal with uh, this real pain so that it doesn't fester in our lives and our relationships. Lord, I pray that our lives will be marked by radically transformed relationships with other people and with you, so that we would know what the true power is of God, Lord, not just in name, but also in reality. Father, would you meet us this week as we deal with such a heavy topic? Will we find rest in you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.